And one of the key elements that we have been finding that is in this uh, text is joy. Joy is just all over the place. There's 16 references to joy in like three to four chapters in a book. That's a pretty big deal. It means that's the central idea or theme that we're going to read about. And so we've learned about um, um, joy in, in ministry, joy in proclamation, joy in faith. Now we're talking about joy in unity. And so I want to start by uh, looking at, um, or we're going to look at verses 27, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, all the way down to chapter 2, verse 4. So let's do that now. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear that you uh, hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that I saw, you saw I had, and hear that I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being full of cord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are uh, binding us together. Lord, we know by the power of your Spirit that as Christians gather together, you are present. And you are present there, bringing them together, not only in body, but in spirit. Lord, I just pray that you would be with RFC and that as we are uh, thinking today and reflecting today on your word, Lord, that you would be subtly going through all of us and just drawing us closer together. Lord, knowing that it's in unity that we'll be able to do your will and the work that you have called us to do in this community and farther abroad. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week has been a rough week. Agreed? It's been a rough week. For many of our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's been especially hard for the Cain community as they try and minister to and care for a family who lost four children and their home. As part of the Rosenor community, we have different relationships with that family. Some are close, others are more distant, but the level of our relationship doesn't make it any less important for us to think about and pray for this family and for the churches that are ministering directly to them. We need to think of the teachers in the schools, the students and the bus mates, the bus drivers and the neighbors, the volunteer firefighters and friends who through this tragedy have experienced a loss. I'm sure that all of you, whether you knew the family or not, have felt an experience of loss. That as you're watching those people around you that maybe knew them closer suffering, you yourself have experienced that and have been part of that and have felt a need or a desire to gather around them and to, and to love them and to pray for them. I'm sure many of you have been praying for them, um, especially as you heard the news. And it almost seemed to me, as I was wrestling through this, that to speak on joy, as my sermon series leads me to speak on, wouldn't fit with the tenor of this week. But the passage today talks about joy and unity, even amidst suffering. And at a time like this where joy is definitely not in the circumstances, I think we can talk about a word related to joy that fits with the time of suffering, and that is the word consolation. Now, consolation is a word we use a lot, but let me kind of try to put it into perspective a little bit. A consolation, uh, for instance, say that you're playing a game, the consolation prize would be what? The prize given to the person in second place. It's a consolation prize. They're consoling them that they tried hard, it didn't, but they didn't end up achieving what they had hoped to. So they get not first prize, not what they desired, but something else. To console someone is to recognize and validate the suffering that they and maybe us as well are feeling. But not letting suffering or pain have the last word. Consolation is walking with others through the suffering. It does not give platitudes. It may not even speak. 
But what consolation does do is give us the knowledge, gives the knowledge to the other that they're not alone. It gives a lifeline. It points to the fact where they may feel that they cannot go on, that joy has not completely fled for the rest of their lives. So today we must read this text in light of dark, the darkness of sin and death. Death is not part of God's plan. Part of God's plan is redemption and bringing life and bringing goodness. Death came as a result of what? Death came as a result of sin. God desires us to have life and to have it fully. So today we need to read this text in light of that. In the light of the uh, darkness of sin and death, suffering and pain that has entered into Paul's life, right? He's in prison. This is no vacation for him. He's having a hard time. We look at our prisons today and we think, well, it couldn't have been that hard. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a time in a desert where it would have been like, a, you know, you're talking about a hole in the ground. You're not talking about three square meals a day. Hey, this is hard for him. He's being persecuted. And when you think about the Philippians, the Philippians, the Philippians themselves are undergoing persecution. And in this last week, these kinds of things have come into our community in a very real way. So joy, while not something we can even contemplate in a time of tragedy, has instead in the word consolation come to mean sharing a bit of life by walking through these difficulties with someone or a community of people who we care for and who care for us. So how do we live through these times? How do we live and find consolation in hardship? First we read in verse 27 that we need to stand firm in one spirit. Now there have been a number of questions within the commentaries about what this one spirit is referring to. Does it refer to community spirit? Well, when I think of community spirit, I think of like cheerleaders, okay? Like, I can't imagine Paul saying, you know, hey, you know, shaking the things and give me an S, give me a P, give me an I R I T. Okay, he's not saying that. He's not a cheerleader. He's not saying, let's get one in spirit, let's get the cheerleaders out, and let's get happy. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here isn't one spirit like that, but the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. He's saying community spirit isn't going to hold you together when we uh, go back to our homes, when we're alone after the tragedy. Like, community spirit's great when they're all around you. But what happens to the person who's suffering that has to go back home? Go back home to an empty house. Places that are empty. That community spirit's not going to help you then. The Holy Spirit is going to help you then. When you have to lay your head down on the pillow at night and the weight of all the emotions and the pain are still there and they're sitting on your chest, Holy Spirit, that's going to help you. And the way He's going to help you is by reminding you of all the prayers that are going up for you at that moment. All the love that those people, those other Christian people have for you. It's going to be the unity in the Spirit that is going to bring a, a sense of of you're not alone. It's not going to make it all better, right? We don't want it to be all better. We want to, when we lose somebody, we don't want to forget. The pain, the pain that we're feeling is a reminder of how great the loss is. How much you love them. Right? We don't want to forget that, but what we want is some comfort. Some sense that we're not alone in this. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what Paul's talking about. It's at that time that the prayers and the connections and the love of Christians have that half of one another. It helps us through. As a very real spirit who is both the spirit in me and the spirit in you communicates these great things to us. Maybe not in word, but in a sense of, what was that word again? Consolation. And a sense of consoling. I'm suffering, yes. I feel like I can't go on. But there are people caring for me. There are people who love me. There are people praying for me. So Paul tells the Philippians and us to stand firm in one spirit. Those of us outside of a tragedy or even those ones going through it must be raising up one another in prayer. We must do consistently and we must do so constantly. Standing firm in one spirit. That's how you stand firm in one spirit. You stand firm in prayer. We must do that constantly so that we can push against the dark forces that are trying to break us down. Why is prayer on Tuesday evenings important for this church? 
I can tell you why. It's because the dark forces of this world are going to try to break down this community. The more good things that happen here, the more that is a beacon to the dark forces around our world to try and break this down. What is your one, what is your weapon? What do you have? How can we stand against it? Prayer. That's all you got. Hard work ain't going to do it. You know, lots of gumption is not going to help. Great websites sure not going to do it. None of that stuff is going to help us survive. If we want to survive this war, if we want to survive, we need to go in prayer. We need to go to God. And we need to let Him be our strength. The one that helps us through the difficult times. Second, we read that our unity should be characterized by one mind. We should be presenting one front, one unified force. When our minds are scattered as a church and each member is following their own agenda, their own goals, their own ideas of what's most important, we are a divided church. And a divided church is a church that will not stand together in times of hardship. I've seen so much debate and struggle and division in church. It's usually over things that are not essential to the faith. You know, I hear people say they're defending the gospel or dividing because of differences that are really important. But what I see is just not true. They divide because the worship music is too old or too new, too soft or too loud. People divide over a lot of things, but most of the reasons, I would say almost all of the reasons, boil down to they're not of one mind. They don't have one mind. So Paul is concerned here for the Philippians because there's the possibility that they might divide over some issue in their time of trial. And it's going to have very little relevance to what should be their primary goal, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It seemed that in Philippi, there was some internal rivalry going on between people about who is the most gifted. You know, you look at that and you go, are you serious? You guys are saying, well, who's the most gifted? Who has got the best spiritual gift? But that happens today. That happens in our churches. It can because we think, well, I'm the wise one. My voice should be the one that's heard. My voice is the one that should be, should be uh, listened to. You know, or, you know what, it should be my music that is the one that should be listened to. I'm the most important. Why? Because, because what's underneath that is because I'm better. Because I know what's the right thing. I know the right way forward. And all of you, you're all wrong. But I've got it. I figured it out. See, now that is, you, that's underlying that kind of, a kind of pride. It seems silly to us that they're arguing about it, but it does can hit us today in the way that we're doing things if we're not careful. And it creates unsteadiness in the church. For Paul, the divided state of the church was the cause of much sadness and was, of course, a constant threat for its dissolution as it came out of persecution. He says that they should drop the silly debate about whose gift was better and instead be in unity. It says in the scriptures to strive together side by side. That's what he says in verse 27. Now Paul's using that phrase very specifically. When he says striving side by side, he has an image here. And the image is of a soldier. A group of soldiers that has to come together to strive as one for them to have a chance of survival. I'm going to show you a picture of what Paul had in his mind as he was uh, reflecting on, uh, on what he meant here. So these are Roman soldiers. And uh, Paul was a Roman, okay? And when he was uh, thinking about the church, he was kind of thinking of this. This is called the testudal formation. Now you can imagine, as you're looking at this picture, imagine if uh, one of these soldiers, say the soldier on the right, right in the middle, he all of a sudden decided, you know what, I don't like where we're going. Oh, we're going to die if we go that way. I'm going to go that way. What's going to happen? What do you think will happen? If all of a sudden he turned and went in a different direction. Who's going to get, what's going to happen? He might be okay. How about the guy behind him? No, he's going to catch an arrow. He's going to catch an arrow, right? Because uh, his, his shield is making it so all the other shields hold together. If, if, how about the guy in the front? The guys in the, there are maybe four of them on the left say, you know what, let's go start our own formation. <laughs> yes, I'm kind of thinking of somebody who might start off their own church, right? We're going to break off. We're going to go somewhere else. Well, all of a sudden, there's a gaping hole, and this is not a good formation anymore. This isn't going to work. Instead, if they stay together, and only if they stay together, are of one mind and of one purpose, do they have strength? 
They become weak when they break up. This is a challenge. You can take that down now. As a church, we must have a spiritual formation. A spiritual formation that will not break down amidst adversity. We must strive side by side. For the, what does Paul say? He says the faith of the gospel. It's proclamation. It's ministry amongst the group. The development of personal faith. And we must, each of us, push forward as a group into these areas. Through the spiritual, physical, emotional battles we face. And I mean this not only in our church, but in your personal lives. That's what the prayer chain is for. The prayer chain is almost like a spiritual formation. It's saying, you know what? You give that prayer out and we will gather around and we will put up our shield. You ever heard that prayer, the, the prayer for, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, the prayer, prayer where we surround. Uh, not, whose prayer was that? John, do you remember? Whose prayer is that, that where the, uh, he had the hedge of protection? Hosea. Hosea. Had your protection. Was Hosea. That's right. So when we pray, when we call, get the prayer chain, what we're doing is ask, actually praying for a hedge of protection. That's what you saw up there too. A formation. A gathering around that had been hurt and protecting. Praying. Gathering together. Becoming a spiritual force. A spiritual strength. Next, I want you to jump down with me, if you will, to chapter 2, verse 1. We can find amongst the reason for such a joy and hardship, a sense of consolation even amidst the suffering, and we find the heart of that right here in verse 1. Paul begins his appeal for their unity on the basis not of human love, but on God's love in Jesus Christ. Again, unity in Jesus takes on a different character than simple human unity because it's based on a common supernatural influence in our lives. Paul begins by identifying how this unity is possible by reminding them of their common experience of Christ's comfort. Isn't that appropriate today? When we're thinking of those who have experienced extreme loss or hardship, what we're to do is come alongside them as Christians because of the comfort that we have received in Jesus. Now a lot of, everybody, every person I would say wants to in their in their own humanity, wants to come alongside and help. But there's something really important that Christians do. We do it for a little bit of a different reason. We do not because some sense of our own heart, but because we know of what God has done and brought comfort into our hearts, that we should extend that to others. And not extend it just for one day. Not extend it just for two days. But months from now, months from now, that Cain community is still going to need help. Are we going to be counted amongst those that fell off or those who continue to care? I hope that we would be people that six months from now and a year from now, we haven't forgotten. It hasn't just become old news. You know, CBC can be around, CTV can be around, and they're around for a day or two days. It's the church that will be around for the rest of the days. And I hope we can be counted amongst anybody who struggles, that we don't give up. We don't stop praying. We become a supportive unity in that. We offer comfort. Why? Because Jesus offers me comfort not just one day, but every day. He is my comfort. The second appeal to unity is the comfort that we as Christians receive from Jesus' love. To reiterate, to reiterate, our unity is based upon something that has already happened in our lives. The supernatural experience of God's love poured out upon us. By seeing each other as having been personally redeemed by the blood of Jesus, this should help us treat one another with a special love. That's one of the reasons it's so hard for me to understand, like at a church meeting or at a, a function of the church, when you see two Christians battling it out amongst each other. I, I want to stop it and say, guys, do you not realize that that person that you're being angry with, that you're yelling at, the blood of Jesus has covered them? That he loves them, and it's the same blood that covers him, that's covered you. And in that, there's unity, shouldn't there be? Wouldn't you agree that we should be able to have unity with other Christians? Even when we disagree, there should be such an, an abundance of love that we're disagreeing over the point, not the person. And there is a subtle difference, and you know that difference. Would, it, would you guys, would you know the difference? The difference when you see two people who love each other who are debating over an issue, I'm thinking of husbands and wives here, 
And then <laughs> some of you are laughing and going, well, <laughs> no, that's right. You know what? So in a marriage relationship, there's love. And the love undergirds the debate. The same thing should be in church. A love should be there that is so clear. And that should bind us together in unity. So far we have seen that we have consolation in our suffering by standing in unity of spirit and mind, by striving side by side for the gospel. We've also seen that we are encouraged for unity by our ex common experience of comfort and love through Christ. Verse th uh, next, and moving on to verse 3 and 4, we have a couple exhortations that are instructive for us in living out our unity in practical ways. Verse 3 says that we're to do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now immediately we say, well, of course that doesn't apply to us. You know, that's, that's, that's just really bad people. People are obviously into shameless self-promotion and personal aggrandizement. But hold on a moment, because what do we know about the Philippians? What do we know about the Philippians? Paul's writing this letter, and he doesn't really have a lot of bad things to say against these Philippians, because they're good Christians. These are good people. These are loving Christians. These are Christians who are willing to go to the death for their faith. So I would say, these are, these are the good ones. He's not talking to bad Christians here. He's not talking to people that have totally fallen off the wagon. He's talking about the good ones. And he's saying, hold on. Be careful. Be careful. You may think you're doing a good job. We have to look. We have to look more closely at ourselves. If we remember back to verse 16, some people were preaching out of wrong motives. Remember that? From selfish ambition, it said. <coughs> they were doing the right thing, preaching the gospel, but their heart was in the wrong place. I think that what we learn here is that even good people, people who are living a Christian life, who can wander into the area of conceit, they may start to think, because God has worked in me, accomplished something with me, because I've stood against the tide that makes my voice, that makes my voice more valuable, more important to be heard. It's a slippery slope into pride once we think we deserve to be heard first. We deserve the praise for what we have done for God. We must keep front and center in each of our lives that we can do nothing of eternal value in our own power. People say, can you be good without God? What's the answer? The answer is, yeah, you can be good without God. Can your goodness have any eternal value without God? No. Those things, those good things that we do as Christians in the Lord's name, the Lord stores those up. And the Lord will never end and he will never forget. So those things have eternal value. Those things that are done for him in the, in the Lord, in his power, those are great things that we have done. And he deserves all of the praise because we couldn't do them on our own. We cannot confess Christ in our own power. We can't testify about God in our own power. No, God must be working through us where nothing of eternal value is accomplished. And because of that, God deserves all the glory. So where is their place for boasting in the church? Is there a place for boasting in the church? There is no place. Except in who? Did I get an answer? That's right. In the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only one that we can boast in. And our example, the Lord Jesus. Okay, this is great. I love this. this is, he turns the tables on us, right? Because the one person who can boast... The one person who deserves all the glory, who never sinned, who never made a mistake, what does he do? He gives it all up to the glory of the Lord for his Father. He gives it all, what does it say? We'll learn, find out next week. He humbles himself and becomes a man. The one who deserved the glory. That's our example. Our example is one of humility and its importance for life. Humility, as Jesus demonstrates, shows us that we not only should think of ourselves as less than God. I don't think we're any, anybody's having any trouble with that. You know, we need counseling. If that's the case, come see me after. If you're thinking you might be equal with God. But it says in verse 3 that we should actually think of ourselves, uh, think of even others as more significant than ourselves. This kind of thinking is so countercultural. Goes against the world's ideas of being first, of rising to the top. Humility, I think, may be one of... Okay, I'm going to change this. Humility is the key virtue for the North American Christian. For the North American Christian, I think it is the key virtue that we need to continue to develop. Humility, because we're so individualistic, 
Because we always want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we always want to take care of stuff ourselves, because we don't want to ask for help, we, want to, we think we have the answers. We need humility. That's how our church is going to be in unity, is through developing this thing, this un unity. Humility is the key virtue for the Christian. Here's why. The very message of a crucified Messiah stands as our example. In Jesus, in whom all knowledge, truth, and holiness resided, in contradiction to the values of a sinful world that would take this as a reason to promote himself above all of others, was instead humble. When we are humble, we are most like Jesus. When we are humble, we rely on his ability to work through the unity of the church. We look to verse 4, we find the second exhortation, more of a qualifier, verse 3. How we might count others more significant than ourselves. How we might do this. Notice how Paul begins by stating something that we might think is contradictory to what he just said about counting others as more significant. It says we're also supposed to look after our own interests as well. It's tempting to read verse 3 as we should be willing to be used by others. Always putting ourselves at others' disposal as simple tools to other people's happiness. I'm sure some super spiritual people have translated this saying that. But look again what Paul says. Don't look only to your own interests. The key word there, only. Only. The problem isn't looking to your interests. After all, how could you be a blessing to your family? How could you be a blessing to your church? How could you be a blessing to your employees if you never took care of your own interests? Right? In fact, much of your family's interests, your employees' interests, are tied to yours. If you're working hard for your interests, that's blessing them, right? It's, 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 it's spreading out. As we're tied together in this, uh, looking out for my interests isn't a bad thing for the other people as well. But there are others' interests in the world who do not necessarily coincide with our own. The question is, what happens to those people? Do we walk by them? Do we ignore the person in our church who is struggling emotionally, spiritually, physically to battle on their own? I watched, uh, I had a, you maybe have seen this, I was given, uh, sent a, a link on Facebook uh, to a YouTube video of, of a young boy, they put a boy, uh, probably looked about 12 or 13, um, on the streets of New York City. And they uh, put him in, uh, it was about this weather right now, and he was with and a t-shirt and shorts. And he had a garbage bag that he uh, had beside him. And he had a sign asking for help. And people would, he was freezing, so you could see it. He's literally shaking. I'm surprised they were allowed to do this. Um, so the, this kid is shaking. He's so cold. He actually gets down and gets into the garbage bag and lays down. And people just continue to walk by. They just continue. You're thinking, how could you do that? You know? But the crowd, right? You get part of the crowd and you just walk by. My question is, my friends, is what happens when somebody spiritually is in that place? They're tattered. They're in that garbage bag. They, don't, they look okay, but their lives are messed up. Do we come on Sunday morning and shake hands and just walk by? Or do we get concerned? Do we ask how we can help? Do we get involved? You know what? It doesn't just have to. It is each of our jobs to be looking out for one another. You don't have to just wait till it comes up in the prayer chain to start praying. You don't have to wait for somebody to say it from the front or to ask for a prayer to begin looking to see if there might be a need. We need to be looking out for each other. That's what this is all about. Caring for one another. Paul wants us to do that. To care for those that maybe whose interests don't align with ours. You know what? We can go on our vacations. We can do all our great things. And God has, God has given those things to you. He's blessed you with those things. And that's a wonderful thing. But when you come back, and you know, are you just thinking about the next one? The next vacation? The next great thing? Or do you say, you know, God has blessed me so richly. How can I turn that into blessing other people? That's what we need to think about. It isn't that we shouldn't be concerned about our interests. But how can that spur me on to be looking at those maybe that haven't been, been so blessed? So here we today, we've seen today that there are struggles and difficulties that come into the Christian life. We've been witness to the fact that tragedy can hit anywhere, even close to home, and it can hit at any time. When hardship comes like that, we might believe that all joy is gone and gone forever. But this morning we turn to that word consolation. 
And there we find our way through the maze of, joy, a maze of hardship to find joy. We remember that there can be consolation in the act of Christians coming together in unity, gathering around the one that is suffering. Finding joy in unity is found in first standing firm against the darkness of death, pain, in the Holy Spirit with one mind, striving side by side and supporting and developing growing faith in God. <laughs> joy in unity is found second when we are unified with and in Jesus Christ. We have received the comfort of His love. We have been given His Spirit. And since we've been given so much and experienced the joys of so much, then we need to offer this joy of connection. We need to offer it to others what we have been given. Finally, to find joy in unity, we must turn these very good things into practice. By examining our motives for the good that we do. Are we getting proud? Do we give too much credit to ourselves? Are our interests all that we're interested in? Paul says instead we must be humble. We must humble ourselves. Raise up the needs of others as equally valid as our own. So friends, this week, let us take the joy of unity with us wherever we go. There are many needs in our community, many difficulties. What we can offer is consolation and unity that the other can know that they're not alone and in that find joy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you have uh, gathered this community together today. Lord, I pray for each one of us. Lord, that we would do our part in being part of that spiritual formation that gathers around those that are hurt, that are hurting. Lord, that we would treat each other well. That we would look out for the interests of others, not just our own. Lord, I just pray that you would um, just move in us in a powerful way. Lord, I pray that you uh, gather this church together. Lord, that you would continue to open the doors for new people. People in our community that maybe don't go to church. Maybe people who have not got a connection with you. And even wider outside of the community. Lord, help those people connect with us so that we can share that good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would save those that are lost. And that, Lord, we would be your servants in accomplishing such a task. We ask this in Jesus' name.